Hello YouTube. In today's video, you can probably tell, we're going to upgrade the CPUs in the DL380 Generation 7 server. I use the word upgrade very lightly here because we won't actually be upgrading it as in getting better performance, but we're going to be upgrading it to get better, uh, better thermals and uh, mostly power draw. Because these are Xeon L5649 CPUs, 6 core 12 thread at 2.26 GHz I believe. They have a turbo boost, so they can go up a couple hundred megahertz. But they only have a TDP of 60 watts each. The CPUs that are in here currently now, the X5650s, are 2.6 gigahertz CPUs, but they have a 95 watt TDP. I have noticed that I don't actually need all of the CPU horsepower in this machine. And I want to reduce the power draw a little bit, so these CPUs will help me with that. So without further ado, let's get her open and uh, take a good look inside. Alright, so let's get the BIOS backup battery unit that is not really working in this server anymore uh, out of the way. We'll just put it down there. Or, well, we'll just put it aside. We also need to remove the uh, cage here. Just pull up on the levers here and get it out of the way. So we can put that aside. And now we've got a nice clean workspace here. Next thing we'll need to remove is the air baffle here. And then of course it's a good idea to not let that and leave that dangling. If this has any value to you, it does not have any value to me because it's uh, probably defective, I haven't actually checked. And now we can see the two massive heat sinks right there. This server is rated, I believe, for the maximum uh, CPUs that you can put in this, and the maximum available in that particular architecture being Westmere. So this will take the X5690s, I believe, which are, I think, 130 watt TDP. So yeah, quite beefy heat sinks there. We'll be downgrading it to more power efficient units instead. So let's see if we can Get the bracket off by hand or whether we'll need some assistance. Typically HP likes to whoops likes to use the T10 bit. So that's what I've got here. This one is very tight indeed. Let's get that out of the way. I believe that's there to stop the heat sinks from jiggling about. Get that out of the way. We still have the same RAM configuration as in the previous video where we took a look at this. Being six blocks of 16 gigabytes for a total of 96. I could fill it up a little bit more, I mean, I've got a box of a couple of 2 gigabyte DIMMs, but uh, yeah, let's keep it balanced. Now we have a nice triple channel 96 gig config, and that's just uh, really nice to have. So now we should be able to pull up on this one, so we can get under, there we go. It's a pretty nice system, this. This is not uh, something that I do often, but uh, I think this should already be good to go. Yep. Just wiggle it side to side and the heat sink comes off. This one is totally dust free, oddly enough. I mean, I don't think this server actually cleaned out its, at any point in its life, but you know, that's cool. So we'll need to remember that this one actually went that way. So I guess it's probably best to just remove the CPU as we go. There we go. One X5650 right there. Uh, okay, so now we need to get one of the new CPUs. And line it up. 
according to the notches, this one has to go in this way. Uh, like so. That's nice and snug in there. There we go, that's in there. Okay. Now we wiggle about the other one. Again, same type of deal. Nice layer of thermal compound there. Let's see, this is indeed the heatsink that is rated for this CPU, for the 1333 bus 2.66 GHz CPU. So you can see here by the uh, sticker here, the part number and uh, all that good stuff. So I'll just leave that there so we can look that up. The other one does as well. So now we can take out this CPU. There we go. Lift that out of the way. Sometimes they're a little bit awkward to hold. So I typically just get them out of the way of the socket as soon as I can. That's the one thing with these LGA sockets. Once you screw one of them up, you're toast. Let's see, the CPUs are clean enough, so I think they'll work fine. We'll just need to put it in gently. Never just plop it in there and hope it uh, everything is all right. Too much force will definitely break some of the pins. Okay. So now I just got to clean heat sinks real quick of all the old thermal goop. Then we can apply some new stuff, put heat sinks back on, and reassemble the server. All right, good to go. Clean the heat sinks up, so now they're, they should be okay. We just need to apply some thermal goop. There we are. Nice little blob there. And one there. These aren't super large chips, but they're larger than your typical AMD or Intel desktop CPU for sure. It's always used just a little bit extra. It's never bad to actually use too much thermal paste. It is way worse to use way too little. So now I just have to put the heat sinks back on. Mm, that jiggles about nicely. Okay, putting it on a pudding. All right. That does feel about right. So now we put that back over. Should be good. Maybe not. Just have to make sure it fits over the heat sinks nicely. And now it is secure. It wasn't properly lining up along the sides. It is now. So now we can start building it back up again. To get all the parts back. Uh, I think this is the piece that goes on first. Or am I being retarded right now? The answer to that is probably yes. I have a tendency to not really pay attention to what I'm doing, so. If this cringes you out, I am very sorry. I mean, I can see it is pretty close to where it's supposed to go, but... Um, I'll give this a, a look up. Right, so now the uh, cover here for the CPU bracket is back on. That's good to go. Now we can put back the air baffle. 
Make sure we're not interfering with any wires. That seems about right. And we put back the riser cart situation. It is currently completely empty. I don't have any risers in the system at the moment. I need to keep that out of the way. Now I can put this back in its place if it wants to stay there. Get that cable out of the way. And put the lid back on. And that is basically the CPU upgrade done. Now, the hard part getting it up and running and seeing if it actually still lives. I have no idea because these CPUs came from AliExpress or eBay or whatever. <laughs> China at least. So you're never too sure. Well, the moment of truth. It might go full on power because I don't think the ILO has initiated yet, but we'll see. It is a server that always takes a little while to boot up, so we'll see what happens. All the hard drives are initializing. So all we want at this point is a video signal. I will admit that I, I'm assuming there might be something wrong with this monitor as well, so. Let's see. The health is totally green on the server. Yes, LED is turning green. Come on. Yes, we have power on. Usually it takes about 30 seconds for this thing to show, uh, show a picture, but I guess now that we have some new CPUs, it really needs to do some extra checks. I'm very happy though that it actually found the CPUs. Yep, there they are. L5640. Option ROM messages. Actually, if I can get there, please do. Because I need to do some uh, re jiggering on the, on the RAID controller. But uh, yeah, it's working. So, we'll take another look at this from the uh, PC. Alright, so now we're on the computer. This is my 2018 Mac Mini, but that's a story for a different video. So let's take a look first at the ESXi here. As you can see, this is the VM that I made on a server that we'll be doing some testing on. Here we have the main interface. We're running ESXi 6.5.0 Update 2. We can see we're using about 8 gigs of RAM, we have about 27 gigahertz worth of CPU, 96 gigs of RAM, and about 1 terabyte of SAS storage. And it clearly reports here 12 CPUs, Intel L5640 at 2.27 gigahertz with our 96 gigabytes of memory. So everything is detected properly from uh, what I can tell here. And uh, the next thing we need to do is to get into this VM here and uh, take a look at some numbers. So I think I already had a session open, but I think I rebooted the machine, so we'll need to go back in. There we go. 
so there is that. So, uh, yeah. Let's do a Cinebench test here. This is a remote session, so recording it shouldn't be an issue at all. I also need to check this time whether the CPU is detected properly, because last time I booted this up, it set itself to 24 sockets, and this is just a Windows 10 machine that can only do dual socket CPUs. And it would appear we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 by 4 is 24. Exactly. Two sockets, so that everything is detected here properly. We don't need more memory than this. 6 gigs is fine for this machine. And I've put in some CPUs of my own that I tested before. This is an E5649 that I had in the Jenkinator. Uh, these were my previous main CPUs in my main system. Uh, same goes for this uh, record here for the 1700 and the 2700X. These are also CPUs. Uh, the 2700X, this 1808 score, is from uh, my current CPU in my main system, and uh, that's pretty beefy. But uh, we should score, I think, between a 4770K and the X5650 dual CPU score right here, because we have some lower clock speeds. We'll uh, end up somewhere in between, I suppose. Maybe we get close to the 3930K, I'm not sure. We're gonna find out. This is also a good way to find out whether Turbo Boost is working properly on this CPU or not. But uh, that's uh, the story for another day. For now, we just have to uh, wait for a little bit here for the uh, render to uh, finish. It's going rather quickly, as you can see. So I really don't think this will take a long time at all. Alright, so one more pass, and there we go. We scored just below the 3930K, so I was just about accurate there. Uh, a 1027. So go, coming from the X5650s that were in there before, we go down about 10 to 20%. That's alright with me. We'll save that. So I get another point of reference there. And of course, we should also try a little gig bench here. Just for the sake of whatever. I'm running it in the tryout mode. And here we go with the CPU benchmark. I am interested to see how this one will score, though, because, of course, the point of reference for uh, Geekbench changes with every version they uh, they go to. Every updated version will have another point of reference in terms of CPU. I think the current version uses a reference of, I think, an i7... Uh, um, I think it was the 7500U. Let me see. So basically, that's what is equal to, uh, I think, about a thousand points in Geekbench or something. That's a little bit of a weird calculation. I mean, you can definitely tell by a benchmark like, uh, like Cinebench that as time goes on and CPUs get more and more powerful, that it's it's becoming less of an accurate test because it can render it so quickly, the scores are just about insane. It's still a good point of reference because the measurement stays the same, so you can more accurately predict the difference in performance between CPUs that were out like six years ago and now, but, you know, it becomes harder to measure individual differences between CPUs because, like the really beefy Epic CPUs these days and, and the top-end Xeons, especially in a dual-socket configuration, if you run Cinebench on those, it'll finish in like sometimes two seconds or something like that. It's crazy. And that makes it pretty hard to accurately measure the performance of the CPU because you're not me really measuring performance over time that much. So you can't really see what kind of thermals and, and turbo boost speeds and all that stuff, uh, how, how those come into play. I mean, plenty of CPUs can do a maximum boost for like, uh, like 30 seconds or something or up to a minute in different power states all that. But uh, if you run a test that only lasts about five seconds, you really can't 
accurately measure the performance of the CPU that it will have during, during longer workloads. And, uh, you know, that's, that, so that's becoming very difficult to do with, with something like Cinebench. I suppose that's, uh, there are better tests for that, maybe Passmark or something like that. But that's something that's just becoming a bit more difficult these days. This old server, however, this old DL380G7 doesn't really have that issue. <laughs> Not at all. It's old. It's from like 2011. But uh, it works. It runs very quietly. It does its job. It, it never complains to me that much. So I suppose uh, I don't owe it anything. Also something that I find very interesting, by the way, now we're just looking at this Geekbench screen here, is that it says 6 gigabytes of EDO RAM running at 1 megahertz <laughs> on a 440BX platform. I mean, that is pretty funny. I mean, the, the fun thing is, I have a 440BX based system actually about 3 feet away from me at this, at this particular moment. And uh, that's an ASUS P2BF with a uh, Pentium 3 750 overclocked at 825 megahertz running Windows Millennium Edition and uh, that doesn't even have EDO RAM, it just uses regular PC-133 so uh, I don't even know if EDO was available on the 440BX platform I think maybe on the LX platform for sure but definitely not on the BX I don't think but uh, that's just you know way back that proves that uh, even I am uh, starting to feel that time is creeping by and uh, we're all getting older. I mean the first video that I uploaded to his YouTube channel is now almost 11 years ago in about three months. So just me uploading something stupid from a DOS, a DOS game called Stunts and uh, now we're here. So that's pretty remarkable I think. So while we're still waiting for this geek punch to finish, um, I suppose, yeah, I could uh, go into the details on the channel a little bit more here. Um, uploads have been a bit rough and a bit slow, I know that. But, and I'm working on some stuff. I had a little bit uh, of things going on, busy with work and some health issues here and there. And just generally not really feeling like recording anything editing it and putting it online. But uh, things are improving now, I'm starting to uh, get into the groove a little bit more. So recording a bit more, got some more in, in the works, so you know, over time we'll, we'll see some more content uh, pop up on the channel for sure. Of course I'm still reading all of the comments every uh, every time they pop up, so and try to respond to all of them. So that's definitely still going on. So, uh, yeah. Right, so, here is the Geekbench score. You can use that for your point of reference. So, apparently our multi-core score is 12,736. Hmm. Especially memory score is quite bad. Well, that's interesting. 13.8 gigabytes per second. Hmm. Huh. For a triple channel config, that's actually not that high. Maybe that's just uh, inter-CPU latency that you can't really measure properly through the VM. Who knows? Um, it's probably uh, just some setting, power saving mode, whatever. So that's our score. So let's go to the recent results and see how that matches up. About 13,000... Okay, so our single core score is about equal to that of a AMD Ryzen 5 2500U. That's a uh, laptop processor. So that's not too bad. Here is our score that we just put in here. The L5640, see, as you can see here, this 1866. Uh, it's a Qualcomm CPU. More Qualcomm stuff. So multi-core wise, we're about as fast as a six-core Mac Pro. That's about thirteen thousand, but that thing is remarkably, uh, or absolutely 
blazing fast in terms of single core compared to our CPU here. So that is interesting to see. All right. That'll do it for me, I think. Well, let's see here. An over this is probably an overclock 3570K. That's a little bit faster than this. That must be a heavily overclocked one. <laughs> And this is the top spec Mac Mini 2018. I have one spec beneath uh, in this, and the multi-core is actually pretty close to this. So I'm I'm interested why this is a uh, the i7 model is actually close to that. I mean, this Mac Mini also does about 20k. So I guess the difference hyper-threading makes is not that big in uh, in Geekbench. So that's been a little uh, fun journey there. I hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.